Pope Francis arrives in Korea for the first papal visit to the country in a quarter century. He emphasizes the importance of dialogue in achieving peace. The Bank of Korea cuts the key rate for the first time in 15 months in a shift from its hawkish policy stance, going along with the Korean government's drive for growth. And North Korea fires short-range projectiles into the EC on Thursday in two separate rounds, according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. Hello and welcome to Arirang News, live from Seoul, I'm Kang Tae-ri. Pope Francis started his five-day visit to South Korea on this Thursday, and in the first meeting with President Park geun the Pope, known for his affection for the divided Korea, has called for more dialogue, patience, and understanding between the two sides. Choi yoo starts us off. On the first day of his much-publicized visit to South Korea, Pope Francis called on the two Koreas to put down their display of force and be patient in trying to forgive and understand each other. Peace is not simply the absence of war, but the work of justice. And justice, as a virtue, calls for the discipline of forbearance. Most of our the pontiff, who has publicly prayed for peace and reconciliation on Korea the divided Korean strategies. peninsula, added justice Korean demands Korean a will for mutually beneficial goals and building our foundations Korean of mutual peace. respect. The Recognizing Korean efforts for stability in the South, Pope Francis said Korean such efforts were close to his heart as they Korean affect Korean the stability Korean of the Korean entire Korean world. President Bak, who back in March proposed increasing humanitarian aid to the North and people-to-people -people exchanges between the two sides to better prepare for reunification, said Pyongyang, for its part, should lay down its nuclear arms. She then asked the Pope to continue praying for those in conflict to forgive, those divided to unite, and for Koreans to work towards a unified Korea. Pope Francis, who is dedicated to the society's marginalized and those in suffering, said not meeting their immediate needs but assisting with their human and cultural advancement should be the main goal. With peace and reconciliation high on the minds of Koreans during the Pope's visit, it will be interesting to see what message President Bak will have for North Korea and Japan Friday, marking the peninsula's liberation from Japan's colonial rule. Choi yoo Arirang News. Korea is very much excited about the Holy Father's visit and attention is on the messages that he'll convey throughout the, the rest of his stay. Pope Francis has always shown a great interest in the marginalized and the poor and he will certainly continue with those efforts during his time here. Park ji has more. This is Pope Francis' third overseas visit since his inauguration in March last year. And in the previous two, the Pope made a point to reach out to those who are suffering and are marginalized. When he visited Brazil July last year, he visited a shanty town where he urged social justice. During his visit to the Middle East in May, he made an impromptu trip to a wall that divides Israel from the West Bank, praying for peace. They are messages the Pope is likely to convey during his time in Korea as well. As Korea is at the center of conflicts, the theme of the Mass will be peace and reconciliation. 
calda del pianeta, diciamo. The leader of the Catholic Church will also deliver a message of hope to the youth. At the 6th Asian Youth Day, a gathering of Catholic young people from 29 Asian countries. Arise, young people in Asia. The glory of martyrs is shining upon you. The Pope will also meet with people who are suffering, including former Korean victims of Japan's wartime sex slavery during World War II, as well as survivors and the bereaved families of victims from April's ferry disaster. He has also reached out to workers who have been laid off from Sangyong Motor, residents from Gangjong Village in Jeju Island, who stand against the government's decision to build a naval base on the island, and residents of Miryang in the south of the country who lost their homes over the construction of electrical transmission towers. All have been invited to a mass for peace and reconciliation on Monday, where Pope Francis is expected to deliver a message on healing and social justice. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. All eyes are on Pope Francis and the events he will be attending across the nation. Our Kim min -ji gives a rundown on some of the interesting facts to look out for. The Vatican's made it a custom to take charter planes en route to foreign countries and depart on local airlines. And that's why Pope Francis, who flew in via an Alitalia Airlines Airbus A330, is flying on a Boeing 777 from Korean Airlines on his way back. The Pope Mobile in Korea this time is Gia Motors' compact model, the Seoul. Pope Mobiles have often been luxurious and bulletproof throughout the years. But true to his reputation as a humble man, Pope Francis insisted on using the smallest Korean made car possible. For air travel, he will be using President Bakunin's presidential helicopter, a Sikorsky S 92. And we can witness his humble nature once again from where he's staying during the trip the Vatican Embassy in Seoul. About 20 square meters in size, his room will be equipped with only the necessities, a bed, wardrobe and table. And his wardrobe is filled with messages. On the 15th, Pope Francis will be wearing a white robe with the letters A and M, which stand for Ave Maria. And for the beatification mass the next day, a red robe representing the blood of martyrs. And on the final day, a dress with a dove and olive symbolizing peace and salvation. Pope Francis is visiting 13 locations and attending 11 official events in this visit that will come to a total of 98 and a half hours. He is traveling 1,000 kilometers within the country. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. And uh, one group uh, that's anxiously hoping the Pope will lend a helping hand during his visit is the bereaved families of the Seolho ferry sinking that's left some 300 people, mostly teenagers, dead. Our Yudian says that the families are tired of waiting on lawmakers to pass a special bill. Under dark clouds and spitting rain at a plaza outside of Seoul City Hall, families of the victims of the Teodo Ferry disaster say they hope the pontiff helps them get the answers they so desperately want. We want to talk to the Pope who wants to be with the families of the victims of the Seoul Ferry disaster. We want to know the truth behind the disaster. The families have been waiting on the National Assembly to pass a special law that would allow for a more transparent investigation into the accident, although rival parties remain deadlocked over key details of the bill. The families contend the lawmakers simply have no political will to uncover the truth. We are ready to die for this. We will not leave until the special Seolho bill is passed. The Pope is expected to meet with family members of ferry accident victims as well as surviving students on Sunday on the sidelines of the closing mass for Asian Youth Day in Daejeon, some 140 kilometers south of Seoul. It will be of great strength to us if the Pope continues to take an interest in this issue and talks about how the government has been slow to get to the truth. The families of the Seoul victims have gone on hunger strikes and embarked on days-long marches to the National Assembly, demanding passage of the special Seoul bill. Yudian, Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Kang Chedi for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8, every weeknight, 
on Arirang TV. Korea's central bank has cut its key rate by 25 basis points after holding it steady for the last 14 months. This move is in line with the Korean government's expansionary policy aimed at boosting the economy. Hwang Jie tells us more. The Bank of Korea has joined a government-led campaign to spur growth in the wobbly economy. It lowered its key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point to 2.25 percent on Thursday, marking the first rate cut by the central bank since May last year. The bank cited sluggish domestic demand brought on by the ferry disaster in April and sagging business and consumer sentiment as reasons for the move. BOK Governor Ijuyar said the cut is a preemptive measure to stop the economy from slowing further while inflationary pressure is low. The rate cut together with the government stimulus measures are expected to improve consumer sentiment and contribute to maintaining growth momentum. Though concerns linger that a rate cut could result in more household debt, which already stands at around 980 billion U.S. dollars, the governor said the debt level is manageable for now. He added the focus should be on how fast the debt level is growing compared to that of income, not the total amount. And that's why the market expects further rate cuts down the road. That uh, if this rate cut does not boost the uh, consumption, uh, we'll likely get another rate cut from the VOK. And uh, we think that the, um, another rate cut will likely come uh, by the end of this year. This month's rate cut was widely expected as the bank was under pressure to go hand in hand with the government that unveiled a set of aggressive stimulus measures last month. While pundits have raised questions about the central bank's independence, the BOK chief was clear about its neutrality, saying the bank does not make decisions that stand opposed to their assessments of current economic conditions. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. North Korea still hasn't given an answer to South Korea's offer for a high-level dialogue. Instead, the regime has upped its threats to calling on Seoul to cancel an upcoming joint military exercise with Washington and to lift sanctions on the regime. Our Hwang Songi reports. Without giving a response to South Korea's recent proposal for talks, North Korea on Thursday laid out specific measures Seoul should take to improve inter-Korean ties. In a statement, the North's agency in charge of inter-Korean relations called on the South to cancel the Ulti Freedom Guardian military exercises with the United States, saying that a failure to do so would push the Korean peninsula to the brink of war. The annual military drills, which Pyongyang calls practice for an invasion, are scheduled to begin August 18th. The Committee for Peaceful Reunification of Korea urged the South to remove what they said were unreasonable institutional mechanisms blocking the contact, visits, cooperation and exchange between the North and the South, a reference to a set of sanctions imposed on Pyongyang following the sinking of the South Korean warship Chonan in 2010. An official at South Korea's unification ministry said the ministry does not feel the need to address such demands by the North and said Pyongyang should accept Seoul's proposal for talks if it really wants improved inter-Korean ties. South Korea proposed high-level talks next Tuesday to discuss a range of pending issues, including a possible round of reunions for families separated by the Korean War. Although the North remains tight-lipped on the offer, it did note the South Korean government should demonstrate its desire for improved ties through practical actions rather than in words. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And in a, de a related development, the inter-Korean communication channel at Panmunjom remains open. Following North Korea's earlier request for an extended working hour, Pyongyang said it has a message to deliver within today, which would mo most likely be about Seoul's offer for dialogue. We will get those uh, details to you as the story develops. 
And in other news of the day, South Korean authorities are currently investigating two North Koreans who swam across the West Sea border seeking to defect to South Korea. Government sources say the two men, one in his 50s and the other in his 20s, were spotted at around 4 a.m. Korea time swimming toward Kyodongdo Island, which is about two and a half kilometers away from North Korea's closest western coast. The two have reportedly expressed their desire to defect to South Korea. South Korea has seen a series of similar cases in the western border regions in recent years. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has clarified America's Asia-Pacific strategy. He says it does not and will not take sides in any of the maritime conflicts that have gripped the region in recent years. Connie Lee has more. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry made it clear that improving U.S. cooperation with China was important to maintain stability in the Asia-Pacific region. Speaking on Asia policy at the East-West Center in Honolulu on Wednesday, Kerry also mentioned that the U.S. does not take positions on the territorial disputes in the South and East China Seas. In light of the sovereignty questions, he stated that the U.S. firmly opposes the use of intimidation or force to assert a claim. Kerry reiterated instead that all parties must work together to solve the claims through peaceful means. He continued to say that these principles bind all nations equally, and all nations have a responsibility to uphold them. Kerry also strongly emphasized that the U.S. will continue to work toward promoting human rights and democracy in Asia. He specifically mentioned that the concentration camps in North Korea should be shut down immediately. Such deprivation of human dignity just has no place in the 21st century. North Korea's gulag should be shut down, not tomorrow, not next week, but now. He added that Pyongyang's proliferation activities pose a serious threat to the United States and to the world. Kerry's speech in Honolulu wrapped up an eight-day around-the-world diplomatic tour, which included the ASEAN and East Asia summit meetings. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And staying with the Secretary of State John Kerry, he also sent a congratulatory message on behalf of U.S. President Barack Obama and the American people to mark the anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule on this Friday. Um, in the statement, Kerry said he looked forward to forging even stronger relations with South Korea to continue to promote peace, prosperity and stability around the world. Indonesia's top diplomat says North Korea has come up with a specific and concrete proposal that could reduce tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Indonesian Foreign Minister Marty Natalegawa met with his North Korean counterpart Lee Soo Hyung in Jakarta on Wednesday. And while he didn't, uh, did not offer specifics about what the proposal entailed, the Indonesian minister said it involved issues that have been, quote, preoccupying all of us, end quote including uh, nuclear proliferation, ballistic missile launches, and military drills. He also gave no indication of when the proposal might be made. During their talks, so Ri also passed along an invitation from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to the newly elected Indonesian president to visit yeah, North Korea. Korea's Incheon International Airport, which routinely tops the global list as one of the best in the world, is a celebrating a milestone. Uh, the number of passengers that have passed through the airport since it opened back in 2001 has surpassed 400 million thanks to increased networks overseas. More than 80 airlines fly in and out of Incheon to more than 190 cities around the world. And it's reportedly building another terminal that will be able to accommodate 62 million passengers and around six tons of cargo each year. A fresh ceasefire has gone into effect over in Gaza Strip uh, following a last-minute agreement between Israel and Palestinian militant groups in Cairo. And for more, Paul E. is joining us from the News Center. Paul, the shakiest truce in Gaza has been extended once again, but there's been reports of both sides trading fire. Is that right? 
Well, just as this new ceasefire was announced, Israel launched airstrikes in response to at least five rockets, which they allege were shot in their direction. Israeli defense forces said they were targeting what they called terror sites in Gaza. Hamas is denying any responsibility for the attacks. It is still unclear what impact, if any, the violence will have on the five-day truce extension, which is reached during indirect negotiations in Cairo. The Palestinian delegation reported significant progress, though differences remained. Some things are related to security and some are related to rebuilding and the lifting of the blockade. I do not want to be derailed into other words. I'm saying clearly the disagreements are over. Some words that may change the essence. However, the principles of the agreement are all a reality with standing in the negotiations. The Palestinians added they were hopeful that a final agreement on a longer-term peace would be reached in the coming weeks, a deal they say will have full Arab, regional and international support. I see. And moving on to the latest flashpoint in Ukraine, a massive Russian convoy of trucks is heading towards the Ukrainian border on an apparent mission to provide humanitarian aid. Ukraine's leaders have cast a doubt on Moscow's intentions, raising fears of a violent clash. What's the current status on this convoy? Well, the convoy of about 260 cargo trucks first left Moscow on Tuesday at local time before stopping at an airbase at the Russian town of Vodonets, which is near the rebel-held territories in eastern Ukraine. The large unmarked trucks reportedly left again early on Thursday, but it's not immediately clear what route they're taking at this point, or if this is the only convoy being launched. Russia says the trucks contain food, water bottles and generators for the civilian population that's been caught in the battle between government forces and insurgents. Kiev claims the convoy is being used as a pretext to send military supplies to the rebels, who now appear to be on the verge of defeat. The decision to help Luhansk and not to allow wide-scale intervention by Russia was made at a parliamentary session with participation of the president, prime minister, parliament speaker and heads of security ministers. Already today, the Ukrainian part of the international humanitarian convoy has set off to Luhansk. Ukraine cannot abandon its citizens, which have become hostages of terrorists on the occupied territories. Ukraine says it will only allow the convoy to pass if the aid is inspected and distributed by the Red Cross and other international monitors. Four months of fighting has produced a humanitarian crisis in parts of Donetsk and Luhansk, which are suffering acute shortages of crucial supplies and electricity. I see. And uh, international health efforts are continuing to help stem the deadly outbreak of the Ebola virus in West Africa as authorities report scores of fatal cases over the last few days or so. And it looks like, Paul, there is uh, this latest aid is coming from Canada. That's right. Canada said on Wednesday that it will donate its majority supply of experimental Ebola vaccines for use in Africa, following by approval by the World Health Organization to offer such drugs to help infected people. Ottawa's health ministry said it will donate up to 1,000 doses of the vaccine to the WHO, while keeping a small amount for domestic research and clinical trials. Meanwhile, Liberia has received its first shipment of the experimental drug ZMAT from the U.S. to help two American aid workers. However, government officials remain skeptical of its effectiveness as a long-term solution. For me, this is not the answer. It's just a matter of trial. We need to continue our contact tracing, our surveillance system. We need to continue the health promotion. We need to continue the mechanisms that will break transmission so that we eradicate this disease. The current Ebola epidemic is the world's largest and deadliest. According to the WHO, over 1,000 people so far have died from the disease, with a vast majority in Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And finally, turning to Brazil, where the country is mourning the tragic death of presidential candidate Eduardo Campos, who was killed in a shocking plane accident. Fill us in on the details. Well, the private jet carrying Campos and his entourage was flying in bad weather, headed for the coastal city of Santos, before it crashed in a dense residential area on Wednesday morning. The 49-year-old was viewed as a business-friendly candidate, placing third in recent polls ahead of the upcoming October election. During an address at the nation's capital, President Dilma Rousseff lamented the loss of one of Brazil's rising political stars. 
Brazil loses a young leader with an extremely promising future in front of him, a man that could have climbed to the highest posts in the country. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is a loss. Regardless of our differences, we always kept a strong relationship of mutual respect. Rousseff, who is up for re-election, said she would suspend all campaigning for three days of national mourning. The Sao Paulo State Fire Department said all seven people on board were killed, while federal police have launched an investigation into the cause of the plane crash. Chetty? All right, Paul, thank you very much for that update, and we'll see you back here in just about two hours. Good evening, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. On and off drizzles have been falling over Seoul throughout the day, while up to 60 millimeters of steady rain has been hitting regions down south along with some thunderstorm and lightning. Now tomorrow is a liberation day here in Korea and we can expect another rainy day with cooler temperatures nationwide. Now gray skies and showers will unfortunately hang around throughout the Pope Francis' visit, but a clear up is in store on Saturday just in time for the beatification ceremony. Now going over to our temperature readings, so we'll top out the Friday morning at 22 before reaching up to 30 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will both top out to 26 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops over to 27, while Tokyo hits 23, while Mount Kungang tops out to the mid-20s. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you, Teddy. Thank you very much, Michelle, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.